I bring greetings to you from Lusaka Baptist Church, um, the church I'm privileged to serve in as a pastor. And as I stand before you, I want to do two things to start with. Uh, first of all, it is to thank your elders for the invitation to me to come and uh, uh, bring God's word. I've heard much about this church. I have come to know a little bit about your pastor and so appreciated his fellowship. The second is a twofold apology. Uh, first of all, I should have taken the adult class, even though it was not going to be the teaching of the scriptures I would have been doing, I would have been sharing something of my testimony. I was going to tell you about myself, just a little bit about myself, and I was going to tell you a little bit about the Saka Baptist Church and uh, the Reformed Baptist work in Zambia. I did not do that, and I am sorry that that did not work. But secondly, by way of apology, um, I have noted that you are expecting me to speak on running the Christian race this morning. Uh, that, as a matter of fact, will happen in the evening. Uh, this morning, I'm hoping to speak on Barabbas or Jesus. That is the question. And uh, where you should have been taking your notes on the Christian race, I trust you can still insert some notes in regard to Barabbas or Jesus. So let me draw your attention to Matthew 15. Matthew 15. We are going to read from verse 1 through to 15, even though the focus will be from about verse 6 to 15. Mark and chapter 15. Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said to him, It is as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now, at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him, whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him! Then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them and delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas 
betrayed Jesus and had him arrested. We all know about that. In the courtyard, Peter denied Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. And before Pilate's tribunal, Jesus Christ was tried and condemned along with a man called Barabbas. This morning, I want to draw your attention to Matthew 15, 6 through to 15, and especially to focus on the choice that was before the Jews, the choice between two condemned sinners, Barabbas on the one hand and Jesus on the other. And the choice was about having one of them released from prison. When asked by the trial judge, Pilate, who between the men they preferred to have released, they made a choice. But whom did they choose? That is the question. And whom did they reject? That's the other question. And who facilitated their choice? Those three questions. That I, that's what I want us to interact with. But before we turn our attention to that, let us observe a couple of preliminary points. And the first one relates to the prisoners, Barabbas and Jesus. Let's look at those two men, beginning with Barabbas. We read about him here in verse 7. And there was one named Barabbas. Two things as we think about this man. First, his name, and then his character. Let's begin with his name, Barabbas. Three things commend them, themselves to us in regard to his name. First, his name, Barabbas, literally means son of his father. Son of his father. Now, this is not a common family name because every man, including every one of us here who are sons, are in fact sons of our fathers, aren't we? So the word father here probably means something else. It's possible that Barabbas was descended from a family of rabbis. You may be aware that a rabbi or a teacher was officially addressed by the name father. If this is true, then he may have been the son of a rabbi. And in that sense, the, the son of a father. And a rabbi was important in Jewish society. They had certain privileges. They would have been well-educated men, and this man probably came from there, possibly an educated man himself, maybe a man of means, a man who had issues with having the Romans rule over them as Jews, a man Matthew describes as having been a notable prisoner. And we would be right in saying that he wasn't just notable, he was notorious. That's what his name means. We also note that Barabbas also stood for a slogan. His name Barabbas was a slogan. It was a cry of freedom. He represents 
emancipation from Rome. He represents freedom for the Jews out of the hand of Rome. His name Barabbas is also associated with the name Jesus or Joshua or Yehoshua. In the New English Bible, for example, the name Jesus was put side by side with the name Barabbas in Matthew 27, verse 16 and 17. So he was, in that manuscript, referred to as Jesus Barabbas. The name Jesus means God saves. Jehovah is savior. Barabbas would therefore have been viewed as a kind of savior. He would at best have been a savior from political bondage. He was fighting for freedom. He was a revolutionary. He was trying to dislodge the Romans, if you like. He was trying to free his people. And in that sense, he was a kind of savior. That is why the name Jesus is probably fitting. It was a common name. I don't know what names are common here in America, but I guess Rob is one of them, isn't it? <laughs> so it was a common name, and Barabbas was named Jesus. What about his character? In verse 7, we are told that he had been thrown into prison for murder. And he was involved in the rebellion, verse 7 says, in an uprising, in an insurrection. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 14, when Peter was preaching, he referred to Barabbas as a murderer. He says, you disowned the Holy One and the Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. So Barabbas was an insurrectionist and Barabbas was a murderer. He wasn't a good man in that sense. That's about Barabbas. What about Jesus? Jesus, of course, was the other prisoner. And regarding Jesus, I would like us to look at his name, his identity, and his character. In regard to his name, Jesus, it also means Jehovah saves. You recall in Matthew 1 and verse 21, just before Jesus was born, an angel said to Mary, or rather to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That is what his name meant. As to his identity, in this text he is referred to as the king of the Jews. During the trial of Jesus, Pilate had asked him in verse 2, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, It is as you say. He didn't dispute it. He owned that identity. And the title, King of the Jews, had both messianic and political implications. Kings were anointed. They were anointed with oil as a sign of God's choosing, as a sign that they were God-appointed and they were God-anointed. And the Lord Jesus Christ was the Messiah. 
the anointed one. God had appointed him and God had anointed him, anointed him without measure. He anointed him with a spirit without measure. He appointed him to be the savior of his people. And he anointed him and equipped him adequately to carry out that work involving the salvation of his people. But he was also really and truly a king. It was said that he would sit on the throne of his father David. He would succeed to David's throne. And he was anointed to be king. He would defend his people. He would protect his people. He would save his people. He was a king. Of course, you are also familiar with the fact that he was the son of God. The son of the father. It's interesting that Barabbas was the son of his father. And Jesus was the son of his father too. But a superior one, wasn't he? What about his character? Well, Pilate suggests that he was a man who had done no evil. And you can catch that sense in the question he asks in verse 14. Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? The Jews wanted him crucified. And other gospels suggest that Pilate had engaged with Jesus, he had probed him, he had sought to understand who he was and what exactly he had done. And he had come to the conclusion that this man had done no evil. That the Jews, the chief priests in particular, wanted to have him crucified because they were envious of him. In effect, they wanted to kill him for his righteousness. And so Pilate asks correctly, what evil has he done? It's a rhetorical question, really. Because he meant to suggest to them that he had done no evil. Barabbas was a murderer and an insurrectionist. Jesus had done no evil. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says concerning Jesus, he knew no sin. He did not sin in what he thought, nor did he sin in what he said. He did not sin in what he felt and in the choices he made, nor did he sin in what he did. He knew no sin. Before the chief priests and before Pilate's tribunal, no one except false witnesses could point at any sin in him. He knew no sin. When he was arrested, it was really for his righteousness. Can you imagine that? He was arrested for his righteousness. He was condemned for his righteousness. He was arrested because the Jews hated his righteousness. He had an impeccable character. He knew no sin. That's Jesus. 
There's a second preliminary I would like us to know together, and it relates to the custom of releasing a prisoner whom the people requested at the feast. We read about this custom in verse 6. Now, at the feast he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them whom they requested. Now, this was an established Jewish custom because in John 18 and verse 39, Pilate said to the Jews, it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. And in Jewish custom, therefore, at the Passover or during the feast of the Passover, they expected the governor to release a prisoner to them, a Jewish prisoner. And for them, this was very significant because at one very well-known Passover, way back in their days as slaves in Egypt, at the Passover, they were released from slavery. At the Passover, they were led to go free, to go to a land that God would show them, to go to a land flowing with milk and honey. At the Passover, during the Passover, they were freed. And this custom, as you would imagine, they were reminded of their freedom. And during this Passover, in Pilate's days, the man who was released reminded them of their freedom during that Passover. So it was a very significant time for them. It was not a Roman custom, but the Romans utilized it for public relations reasons. Pilate took full advantage of it to promote good public relations between the Romans and the Jews. But this action also fitted in well with the biblical prophecy that one of the things the Messiah would do would be to bring freedom to the prisoners. In Luke chapter 14, rather chapter 4 and verse 18, Jesus himself declares in fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy that among other things he came to bring freedom to prisoners, to those in bondage. And in this instance, in an unexpected and strange sort of way, the prisoner who would be freed would be Barabbas. So Pilate, having been familiar with the custom, incited and encouraged the people to choose or to ask Jesus to be released. It would appear that Pilate didn't want to release Barabbas. Barabbas was a murderer. Barabbas was an insurrectionist. Barabbas was fighting the Romans, his masters, so to say. How would he want to release him? But Jesus, in his estimation, was a righteous man. He wanted to have Jesus released. And so he prompts them, do you want me to release him whom you call king of the Jews to you? Do you want me to release Jesus, your king, to you? That was the question. And our question is, did they choose him? Whom did they choose? 
between Barabbas and Jesus. Let's come back to the answers then regarding their choice between Barabbas and Jesus. And I want us to note three things there. First, they chose Barabbas. They chose Barabbas. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. And the multitude crying aloud began to ask him to do just as he has always done for them. And when he asked whether he should release Jesus to them, at the urging of the chief priests, they chose to have Barabbas released to them, according to verse 11. Luke 23 puts it this way. They yelled back at Pilate, away with this man, they said, concerning Jesus, release Barabbas to us. Away with Jesus. That's not all. They kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. They were not content with having Jesus remain in prison merely. They wanted him crucified. They wanted him put to death in the most cruel of manner. The, the crucifixion was a punishment reserved for the scum of the earth, the outcasts of Jewish society. Yes, murderers deserve to be crucified. Robbers deserved to be crucified. People who committed terrible crimes deserved to be crucified. Jesus did none of those. And yet the Jews wanted him crucified. They were willing to take this responsibility on themselves. They were willing to be found guilty of murder themselves when they shouted, Crucify him. Crucify him. But I'll come back to that. They chose Barabbas. One who would fight for freedom. Their freedom. And this freedom was of a political nature. They preferred temporal freedom through Barabbas. They preferred political freedom through Barabbas. And so they chose him. I wonder what kind of freedom you are choosing. What kind of freedom you have chosen. And what kind of savior you have chosen. Have you chosen a political savior? What kind of savior have you chosen? They chose Barabbas. But in choosing Barabbas, the second thing I want us to note is that they rejected Christ. They rejected Christ and consigned him to the cross. Away with this man. We want Barabbas. But not just away with him, crucify him. And in rejecting Jesus, they were rejecting salvation for their souls. They chose political freedom, temporal freedom, and rejected salvation for their souls. They publicly chose to be guilty 
of murdering the Savior. They would not have a Savior. They wanted the Savior murdered. They rejected the Savior. They wanted the Savior put to death. They rejected the Savior. They wanted him put away so they would have no real hope, no real salvation, no real redemption. And the world today is busy doing just that. It's no longer cool to believe in Jesus. It's no longer the civilized thing to believe in Jesus. That is what people did in the olden days when they were not civilized, when they were backward, that's what they did. They believed in God, they believed in Jesus. We now know better, they say. We have technology, we are advanced. We've gone past the need to have that form of spiritual freedom. And they are choosing a spiritual freedom designed by the Eastern world. They are choosing transcendental meditation. And, and they are choosing mysterious kinds of freedom. Not the freedom that comes with Jesus. Away with that, they say. It's backward. They want something a little more scientific. And so they consigned him to the cross and wanted him to perish there. But let's note a third thing. They had their choice facilitated by none other than Pontius Pilate. Pontius Marcus Pilatus. And Pilate, according to verse 15, decided to grant their demand. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them. And he delivered Jesus after he had him scourged to be crucified. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. He released a man who was fighting against him. <laughs> he released a man who was undermining his authority. He released a man who was trying to get rid of his job. <laughs> He released that man and surrendered Jesus to people Pilate knew had Jesus arrested because of envy. Pilate knew they hated Jesus. They were envious of Jesus. They wanted to destroy him for that reason. And he surrendered him to them. So the Jews preferred a murderer. And Pilate facilitated that. Let me come to my final point, which is a conclusion. And there are three applicatory points I want to, to make as we work through that. The first is a question. How would you have voted if you had to choose between Barabbas and Jesus? If you said you would have voted for Jesus, 
If you said you couldn't bear the thought of having him crucified, that you love him too much to see him nailed to the cross, I would have said, going by my feelings, I would feel with you. But would that have been the right thing to do? Would you, like Simon Peter at Caesarea Philippi, horrified at the prospect of seeing Jesus suffer, when Jesus therefore expressed the fact that he would be arrested and that he would suffer and die, Peter rebuked him. Peter said, no, 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 don't think like that. You, you, you are the Messiah. You, you, you will rule. You, you will sit on a throne. You will overcome the Romans and and set us free as Jews. You, you won't die. You won't suffer. Don't say that. Would you have had Peter's attitude and not let Jesus suffer and die on a cross? Would you rather have taken up arms like Peter did took a sword and cut off the ear of one of those people who had been arresting Jesus, would you have stood to defend Jesus and protect him and ensure that he doesn't go to the cross and suffer indignity at the hand of the Romans? Please consider my question again. Would you have voted for Jesus to be freed and not be crucified? Knowing what you know today as a redeemed sinner and as someone washed in the blood of Jesus, would you have voted for Jesus to be freed? You who glory in the cross, you who sings at the cross, at the cross, where I saw the light. Would you have voted to have Jesus freed from crucifixion? That's the question. I'll come back to that question in a moment. Let's look at this second point which clearly shows that the release of Barabbas was a striking, a striking type of the gospel plan of Jesus. The guilty Barabbas is set free. The innocent Jesus is put to death. The great sinner, Barabbas, is delivered. The sinless one remains bound. And he ends up being crucified. Barabbas is spared. Christ crucified. That's the gospel, isn't it? The murderer is released. The innocent is killed in his place. What a striking emblem of the manner in which God pardons and justifies the ungodly. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, we are told concerning Jesus that he was made sin for us. He who knew no sin was made sin for us so that we might become 
the righteousness of God. That's how God saves. The murderers, the adulterers, the liars. People who deserve to die and go to hell and live there forever apart from God are rescued, are saved, are released because their sin is imputed to Christ and his righteousness is imputed to them. And they are left to go free. Even a Barabbas can find salvation and hope through this scheme. He was led to go so he can die. And in doing that, he provided hope for those who are sinful and hopeless, who may spend an eternity in hell if they don't repent and come to Christ. But Christ was killed so they can have hope. You might be like Barabbas, a murderer, if not in physical terms, at least inwardly in your heart, you do murder people through your anger. You do murder people. Just as Barabbas was freed, you can be freed because someone else, someone else has borne the, borne the punishment for your sin. In Barabbas' release and Christ's crucifixion, we have a picture of how God saves sin for men. But coming back to the question, how must you choose between Barabbas and Jesus, therefore? It's a vital question. And there are only three possible answers. The first is the Jewish way. And the Jewish way was to have Jesus crucified. Let me put it differently. The Jewish way was to have Jesus murdered. We are not called to murder the Savior because when we do that, we will not have a Savior. Then there is the Pilate way. Pilate chose to be neutral. Pilate knew that Jesus did not deserve to die. But Pilate also knew that if he didn't hand over Jesus, he will be politically unpopular. He will be politically weak. And so he chooses to make a political decision, a politically correct decision. There is finally the Christian way. And if we go by the Christian way, we cannot participate in the crime that chose to have Jesus murdered. And we cannot choose to be neutral. The neutral point is probably where some of you are. You can't decide. Must I choose him or must I not choose him? If I choose him, I may lose some benefits I'm currently enjoying in the world. If I don't choose him, 
I will continue to be popular in some way. So which way must I go? And your indecision leaves you exactly at the point where Pilate was. He just chose not to have any part in what the Jews were doing. I'll leave you to do it. He was the governor. He should have made the decision and he should have made the right decision. But he leaves it to the Jews. Do as you please. Do as you will. And elsewhere we are told that he even asked for a basin of water and he washed his hands clean. I'll have nothing to do with it. His wife also counseled him to have nothing to do with it. He remained neutral without a savior. The Christian way is not a neutral way. In the Christian way, we choose the way of God. The way of God for our salvation. God chooses how we will be saved. God chooses how we will be released from sin. And God in his sovereign wisdom decided to have Jesus crucified. It was God's decision to have Jesus crucified. And through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ to have sinful men released. God's way. And God's way sounds something like this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. When Barabbas was released, I imagine he, it, it must have surprised him. He was a murderer. He was an insurrectionist. And he knew if he should be condemned that he deserved to die. He knew that. But the message came that he would be released. And I imagine him asking, him, uh, asking the question, how did it happen? And they must have told him, they have decided to crucify Jesus and to have you released. Really? I, I can't believe this. This is wonderful. Just like that? Yes. The answer came. Just like that. In a similar manner. You deserve to die. You deserve to go to hell. You deserve to be separated from God forever. So you can pay for your sins in hell forever. But you can be free. You can be released. Because God has decided that Jesus would die instead. God has decided to let you go free. Jesus was crucified because God has decided to lay the iniquities of us all on him. He made him guilty by imputing, putting to Jesus' account your sin and mine. My friends, Jesus is standing there in the place of David who committed adultery. Who murdered Uriah. And Jesus is standing there in the place of Abraham 
who lied about his wife. And in the place of Jacob, who was deceitful, he is standing there in their place. Standing in the place of Paul, who was violent, and who had a plan and intention to destroy the church. Jesus is standing there in their place. He's taken their sin. Barabbas is standing there, the hardened criminal and an insurrectionist. If the spirit should open his eyes and point him to his sin and that he would die for those sins. He may temporarily be released from prison, but if he doesn't repent, he would go to hell too. But if he must be saved, he must choose Jesus. He can be rescued too. He can be freed too. Jesus stands there to save even the likes of Barabbas. And my friends, Jesus is standing there in your place and I don't know what you have done. I don't know how you have sinned. I don't know the things that separate you from God right now. I don't know the sins which if you die today, you would definitely go to hell and not to heaven. But Jesus is standing there and calling you and saying to you, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. And if you come to him, if you call upon him, if you say, I have sinned, help my unbelief. I have sinned, release me from my sin. I have sinned, free me today. I believe you are able to free me today. He will. You are prob probably familiar with the story, and I read it from one of Spurgeon's sermons, he wrote about a man who was in a two-story building that was on fire. He couldn't leave the house because the bottom part of the building was all on fire. There was only one way of escaping from that house. And it was to jump off from a window in the upper floor. But jumping off would mean crashing to his death. So what does the man do? A man, very strong, big man, I imagine tall like Brother Rome. <laughs> he came up and called out to him, drop into my arms. He looked down at him. And Spurgeon says, it was part of faith for him to know that there was a big man there. It was part of faith to believe in his heart that that man was strong enough to hold him so he doesn't crush to death. But the crown of faith lay in the dropping. He must drop into the arms of that man. If he doesn't drop, he may know that the man is there, he may believe that he's powerful enough to save him, but he'll still burn. He must drop into the arms of that man. And drop that man did into the arms of this strong and powerful man. My friend, you are like in a house that is on fire. 
And if you don't run away into the arms of a savior, you will burn in that fire. You will burn because of your sin. He stands and he calls you, come to me, drop into my arms and I plead with you, do it. If you are asked to choose between Barabbas and Jesus, I say to you this morning, drop into the arms of Jesus. Choose Jesus and you will be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your holy word. And we thank you for the gospel that holds before us a savior who is able to do the impossible. A savior who is able to save murderers and adulterers and liars and gossip us, and atheists. Oh God, grant us faith to see him. Grant us faith to choose him. Grant us faith to rest in him. Thank you, Lord, and save your own, because we pray asking this in Jesus' name. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen.